presenters. Uh, so I will be talking about the research which was mostly done over last year, and it will include like few small parts uh, on it, but it's all about black hole X-ray binaries. And just to remind you what black hole X-ray binaries I'm talking about, I will be concentrated on low mass X-ray binaries, and uh, low mass X-ray binaries, they named generally after they donors. They mainly have frosch lob overflow companion, which is a low mass, it's either main sequence or a ray giant or a white dwarf. Um, this class includes a broad range of uh, binaries with periods from 10 minutes to 100 days, basically from a white dwarf to the ray giant, and the uh, ages um, of the donors could also be different from 100 million years to 10 giga years, as well as mass transfer time scales could differ from 10 millions to giga year. So this kind of low mass extra binary class contains lots of binaries of different varieties. <clears throat> it can appear on the X-ray sky as a persistent or as a transient source. Um, <clears throat> The important thing, it can be detected in a very distant galaxies. Just for a comparison, when we talk about high mass X-ray binaries, it's again, it's not about the mass of a creature, it's only about the mass of a companion. And the class high mass basically means that generally, for the most of the companions, you have a wind-fed a wind um, type of a mass transfer, not a roche lob overflow. So again, the binary periods could be also different, but uh, the main thing is that the hard X oops. That's, sorry, it's wrong. But uh, the main thing is that the X-ray spectrum is a little bit different. It's a hard X-ray spectrum. So I will be talking about only about low mass X-ray binaries and why actually low mass X-ray binaries are important for us and why do we care? Well, first of all, just to tell you that the only observation confirmations so far about stellar mass black holes that we do have are coming from X-ray binaries, no, from nowhere else. <clears throat> Uh, low mass extra binary and high mass extra binary give us the best constraint to date about what was the natal kick of a supernova at the time of a black hole formation. <clears throat> In order to understand what are gamma ray burst progenitors, we most likely will need to understand the black hole extra binaries as well because of uh, this type of evolution very likely was preceding to the gamma X-ray burst uh, event. Laga and Lisa, those objects which are not seen yet and only been theoretically observed some possible candidates for Lee, for, for from double neutron stars, if we want to make any constraint about the double black holes, we obviously need to understand first uh, black holes with other stars. And as I said, we only see them in low mass and high mass X-ray binaries. Our knowledge of low mass X-ray binary, we hope, eventually will help us to understand intermediate mass black hole and interpret properly uh, so-called ultra-luminous X-ray sources. So there is a variety of reasons why we're interested in low mass X-ray binaries. And <coughs> today, it's about only two dozens black hole X-ray binaries, or black hole candidates, is observed in <coughs> Uh, have been absurd and detected. So, as I said, they could be varying in the mass of a companion, but it's only 20, so the statistic is pretty small. So, how have they been formed? There is a so-called standard paradigm of low mass extra binary formation. So you start um, with uh, two stars. Um, one of them should be relatively massive. At some point, most likely a primary overfill its rush lobe, and most likely pass through the so-called common envelope event. It means that this uh, initially more massive star, which became now a red giant, had swallowed its companion, which started to spiral in inside this common envelope. So why we need it? Well, actually, one of the reasons why we need it is that because we know that your low mass extra binary has a very short period. So if you just will think about what size your massive star had before, it was bigger. Uh, <clears throat> in size than the binary separation that it had now. So obviously something had happened, and most likely what happened, it was a common envelope event. So after common envelope event, you are left with a naked core of your previously massive star. At some moment, it blown up a supernova, so you have enough uncertainty, which is a natal kick of supernova, which may or may not destroy a binary. So then you're left with your black hole and your low mass companion, which, if you're lucky and it was close enough to the common envelope and after the supernova kick, can start <coughs> uh, 
again decrease its uh, binary separation to the other mechanisms of angular momentum loss. And the most efficient are through gravitational wave radiation or through magnetic braking. So magnetic braking is uh, normally operates in stars which have convective envelopes and have magnetic field. So you take the specific angular momentum, in this case not from the surface, but um, <coughs> from the sphere where your uh, ramp pressure is equal to your magnetic pressure. So you efficiently, through your stellar wind, take, some, take more of the angular momentum from the binary, which it will be otherwise. So through those mechanisms, you slowly decrease your orbital separation until your donor also comes into contact and starts the mass transfer. So that's a standard scenario, how you form a low mass extra binary. So, is it always this way? Is it always that relatively simple? Well, not exactly. And uh, in fact, everything in this scenario, almost every single step, can go differently and can go wrong. And I will start to talk about this, uh, starting from the common envelope. <coughs> so again, a common envelope is the phase in the life of a star when one of your star is a giant, and it has a well-developed and separated very dense core and sparse envelope. Another star enters this envelope, starts to spiral in, losing its orbital momentum, transferring its orbital energy into the envelope. At some point, a magical point, the envelope takes off and disperses if you had enough energy, or the whole binary merge and create a single star. In order to evaluate whether you have a merger or you have a surviving compact binary, people try to estimate the ener energy budget based on the how much energy you have to put into envelope so it can take off, compared to how much energy you could actually drag from your orbital, uh, <coughs> orbital energy. So you compare your orbital energy and the binding energy of envelope, and you introduce a cold um, efficiency parameter. So efficiency parameter just tells you how much uh, orbital energy you can efficiently use. And by the conservation of energy, of course, it should be less than one. Um, the binding energy can be parameterized through a simple formula, and so called parameter lambda. When initially this has been introduced, people only looked on the low mass donors. And if you compare the binding energy of envelope for low mass giants, like about one solar mass star, lambda is always about one. So the standard paradigm is to take alpha lambda equal one. Now, if you take into account how many black hole extra binaries you see, and if you take into account how long can they live, you could end up with formation rate. So the formation rate for Milky Way black hole X-ray binaries is about 10 and minus 6 per galaxy per year. Um, binary evolution uh, people, when they try to evaluate how many you can form theoretically based on whatever you know about initial mass function, about the mass ratio distribution for initial binaries, they say that in order to reproduce this um, formation rate, you are required to have alpha lambda, which is unphysically high. <clears throat> and um, it should be about 10 or more. If you use alpha lambda equal one, then theoretical formation rate is at least 100 times smaller than it's observed. Things became only worse than people tried to look what's a real lambda in real stellar models. And it was shown that for massive stars, which are progenitors of your black holes, the lambda is as small as 0.01. So having alpha lambda 10 means that you have to have alpha about 1,000, which slightly contradicts to the energy conservation problem. Another thing is that if you, for example, instead of forming a binary with a main sequence star, those which we see, on our sky or red giants, you'll think about the formation of a binary with white dwarf. The situation is a little bit different. You can create a low mass extra binary with a white dwarf, having a common envelope, not at the beginning when you had still a massive giant, but 
at the end, after you had a black hole, because what you have, you have a black hole and a white dwarf. White dwarf can be a remnant of a previous red giant, so you have a common envelope when you already have a stellar mass black hole, about five solar masses star, and a, like a one solar mass red giant. In this case, you don't have any energetical problem at all. So it is much, much easier to create a black hole white dwarf binary. The interesting thing, so it's theoretically, it's hundreds of thousand times more easier. However, to the, to the date, there is no even single black hole white dwarf binary observed in the galaxy field. So you don't have an energetic problem, but you have observational problem. Here you have an energetical problem, but you do observe them. Slight contradiction. So the way to resolve the problem which was proposed is to think maybe what we do see now as low mass extra binaries, they actually run at low mass donors at the beginning. They've been intermediate mass donors, like a three or four or five star masses. So then you can avoid your energetic problem. <coughs> The only problem is that in this case, you don't have normally a mechanism to shrink your binary separation. And so the way to resolve it was to propose that there are some stars, intermediate mass stars, that still have strong magnetic field. They are known as AP stars, or peculiar magnetically strong stars. And so those magnetic field was proposed also could bring the stars to the contact and help to start the mass transfer. Um, Indeed, the absurd magnetic field could produce whatever is required theoretically. You could reproduce orbital periods, donor masses at the time when you observe them, lifetimes and production in production rates. However, at the moment when this work has been done, already what was observed are also effective temperature of donors. You know, it's always whenever you have more data from observations, it's a little bit kills one by one theoretical ideas. So, on this plot, I'm showing the orbital periods of absurd black hole binaries, and this is effective temperature of the donors. This track shows showing what will happen to the binaries with intermediate uh, mass donors. So we start somewhere here, they slowly dig up, but they move to the left to the shorter orbital periods, but they always have temperature much higher than the observed. So for observed, temperatures, it is shown the absolutely possible upper limit. The lower limit is much lower. So in, I don't show it here the error, but it's somewhere like, like this. So this is the absolutely possible, uh, absolutely maximum possible uh, effective temperature. So you could not reproduce that. So the same authors we checked, so the same problem exists with even with low mass, uh, low mass donors. So whatever donor you have, intermediate mass donor or low mass donor, you always will be much, much hotter when it is observed. People try different ideas like irradiation, uh, some puffing, nothing could bring you down to, this, to the observed temperature. I mean, you could a little bit change, but not by as much. <clears throat> the next observation was that only in one system, which can be actually explained by the theoretical effective temperature, uh, the chemical analysis shown that they have senior elements in it. And that was good because it is consistent with having an intermediate mass donor. But in those systems, people found lithium. You know that lithium burns first. Um, so it's really hard to explain how you could have intermediate or low mass donor um, <clears throat> and still, which could still have lithium. So I just want to show you a little bit how the evolution happens. So the same uh, kind of diagram with the orbital period and effective temperature of a possible donor. So the blue line shows where the zero HMA sequence could uh, be. Once your star evolves on this diagram, assuming it's always at the Roche lobe overflow limit, but doesn't do the mass transfer, just a limiting case. So it's, its trajectory on this diagram will be like this. So this is 1.2 solar mass star, 1 solar mass star, 0.8 solar mass star. 0.8 solar mass star is getting closer, not too close, but getting closer. But the problem is that only one solar mass star, about just a little bit low, will, clo will cross this line at the Hubble time. You basically don't have any 0.8 solar mass star evolvement here, never speaking about the even lower mass stars. So now what will happen if you start to mass transfer from a main synchronous star? You start to mass transfer, 
and you're, boom, you dripped down here. So this is the trajectory of a star if it starts with mass transfer. Okay, what will happen if you start when you're subjoined? You go to this direction. So basically this zone where you do observe a black hole candidate donors is an avoidance zone. You couldn't theoretically arrive to there. <coughs> There's an issue, of course. Um, if you think about when the binary was formed, you'll recall that the black hole is formed is at only about a few million years after the start of the star formation for this particular binary, for example, or for this region. <coughs> so in six, eight year, uh, million years, you already have your black hole. On the other hand, in about 10 million years, only stars more massive than two solar masses will actually reach their main sequence. Before that, they still will be at pre-main sequence stage. And pre-main sequence stars, they do have lithium. They don't have to create it by some strange mechanism, but they just simply didn't burn it. <coughs> and the question, if we observe anything like that, yes. So here the observations and the theory, they do agree. We do have Wisterlund 1 cluster, where you at the same time have an X-ray pulsar, which is a neutron star, as you know. We cannot say about black holes because you normally don't observe them individually, and we don't have black hole X-ray uh, binaries, but we know that the turn of mass in this cluster is about three solar masses. So all the stars which are less massive than three solar masses, they're still at their pre-main sequence. So what will happen if you'll try to evolve a binary with a black hole and pre-main sequence star? A pre-main sequence star, they're much more puffy, they're colder, and they actually are here. So they start somewhere here, beyond the the diagram and evolve this way. Here they start the main sequence and then evolve further. The only problem with premium sequence stars, they contract. They became smaller and smaller and smaller. So even if you by some magical mechanism will start the mass transfer, how you will keep doing the mass transfer? The answer is that the premium sequence stars also have much stronger magnetic field than any main sequence stars. It's about 1,000 times stronger magnetic field. So in fact, you have a, such a strong magnetic breaking that if you actually assume, if you plug your magnetic field in a standard magnetic breaking model and will try to see what happens to your orbital separation, it shrinks fastly. And when you start a mass transfer, it allows you to stay on the contact all the time. <coughs> So maybe with black hole candidates, we do deal with premium sequence stars. However, it still doesn't answer the question, how did we survive an energy budget problem? <coughs> Sometimes ago, for another project, uh, I was studying the slow mergers of massive stars. So the idea was to look what will happen if you actually do have a binary which initially, by energy estimate, should merge. So what will happen in this case? The problem is quite interesting because you ha do deal with uh, different time scales and different dynamical scales. So you have an envelope which is 10 and 14 centimeters. You have some region where you do have a merger itself when the one star starts to transfer its material to the uh, helium core. And you have a nucleus in that happens just at the top of the core. So the problem, of course, is very interesting. In some uh, sense, it resembles the jet problem. The only uh, difference is that this time, jet goes towards the gravity field, and it also goes to the increasing density gradient. But otherwise, it's the same jet. It, ha it has the same problems. It has the same instabilities. But what we can find is that how deeply this uh, material can penetrate into the red giant core. And what appears it is that depending on what mass of your donor is, and more likely for donors with smaller masses who have lower entropy, that's the main difference between main sequence stars. The higher your mass, the, the larger your average entropy of your star. So the smaller the entropy of material which falls onto the helium core, deeper you can go. And if you go deep enough, it happens that you penetrate exactly to the helium burning zone. And if you bring a fresh hydrogen into the helium burning zone, which is 10 and 8 kelvins, what happens is that you have a very uh, explosive uh, burning of hydrogen. And sometimes it's so enough that you actually can remove not only the whole envelope, but also the helium layer itself. Because you, uh, 
the amount of energy which you speak about is about 10 and 51 ergs. So it's absolutely enough to remove the whole helium layer. What you left as a result from the binary which should have been merged, you have a naked uh, carbon core and the donor around and your envelope is just uh, blown away by this thermonuclear explosion. So we call it as a nuclear driven common envelope event. <clears throat> that was a very interesting finding also from another point of view because you may know but uh, long gamma ray burst been for some time uh, at least some of them connected to the type 1 C supernovae and 1 C supernovae are those which don't have any helium lines. So if you consider this model and this model what it does, it creates you a completely naked carbon core, which also span up strongly during the process of the accretion. So you, at the same time, also get a very fastly spinning core, which can become a gamma ray burst progenitor. The formation rates match up pretty nicely with both short period black hole MXB formation and gamma ray burst, uh, long gamma ray burst formation. So, that was about black hole, well, black hole main sequence binaries. Now the question is, so what about black hole white dwarf binaries? Well, I still will not be able to answer why we don't see them in the field. But about a year ago, a little bit more than a year ago, a first ever black hole white dwarf binary was detected. But it wasn't detected in the field. It was detected in the global cluster. And the special feature of this uh, black hole candidate is that it has characteristic energy for uh, about 10, 15 solar masses black hole. <clears throat> it has strong variability showing that it's a point source. It has strong broad O3 emission lines and very low at the limit of no detection um, hydrogen to oxygen ratio. So it was assumed that it's a black hole white dwarf binary with oxygen or maybe carbon or whatever, but not, no hydrogen at all. And most likely it's a 15 solar mass black hole. So how common are global clusters? I mean, does it actually work for us to look uh, for formation mechanism in those uh, conglomerates? Yes, they're pretty common. They're pretty abundant. You could have them in different type of galaxies. The interesting thing is that in some galaxy you will have up to 10,000 of global clusters. So why it's important is because <coughs> when you deal with the big statistics, then you can find uh, these objects, even they have like formation rate one per thousand of a global cluster, but you, if you look on 10,000 global clusters, you still can find it. So already after discovery of that black hole, white dwarf binary, which was conferred by different uh, observations, people tried to look back on the uh, X-ray observations of global clusters in elliptical galaxies. <clears throat> in this case, they could not say for sure that it's a white dwarf companion. They only tried to look if they have an uh, X-ray binary that has energy strong enough to be qualified as a black hole. Uh, um, a creator. So in 6,000 global clusters, uh, in the, in the <coughs> selection by Kim, it was eight possible candidates. Uh, here in 3,000, it was two. And Greg Sivakov also looked up and found seven in his uh, sample of global clusters. On the other hand, it was actually proved before that black hole x ray binaries with non degenerate companions are not expected to be detected in global clusters. There are various reasons why you couldn't form a black hole main sequence binary by dynamical reasons. So here I will concentrate about how you can form it with a white dwarf. So first of all, how many black holes you could have? <coughs> yeah, the color is not good. It's actually not red on my computer, but. <laughs> um, so if you will take the initial mass of a global cluster, then you can estimate that if nothing else happens to this global cluster, but it just evolved as some stellar mass, so no interaction of global cluster with a galactic field, no tidal losses, no anything, then every 200 solar masses of uh, this global cluster will produce in the result one black hole. Um, 
roughly half of these black holes, because black holes also have some mass function, roughly half of this black hole will be more massive than 10 solar masses. And we are most interested about 10 solar masses black holes, because all the sources uh, for which we uh, got the statistics being for the uh, black hole candidates, which are most likely 10 solar masses or more. And the reason is that for slow masses, you cannot really distinguish whether, especially for the distant uh, observations, whether it's a neutron star or a black hole. So we have some numbers how many you can form if you knew what's the initial mass of a global cluster. And we know that uh, some fraction of them you should have lost because they have natal kicks. So about 30-40% of them should have been lost. So now, assume you form them and they stay in the global cluster and you have dynamical encounters. So there is a mechanism in the, that operates in the global cluster and it causes a spitzer instability. So it's basically if you, for example, take the glass of cold water and a glass of hot water and mix it, each other, mix it with each other, then you will get a glass of a warm water, right? So because you came to the equilibrium. The same happens to the stars in the global cluster, with the only difference is that they try to uh, equipartate the uh, kinetic energy. So if you have like a 15 solar mass black hole and one solar mass main sequence star having the same kinetic energies, it means that the velocities will be different because you have mv square to be equal. So what happens, so black holes through this process, they get in smaller and smaller velocity and they basically sink down to the core. That's called a spitzer instability. Um, and the, for a long time it was assumed once they sink down to the core, they kind of dynamically <coughs> detach themselves from the other stars in the global cluster. They form their own small black hole subcluster and interact or see only each other. During these interactions, we also have much higher concentration. Those interactions are really fast. When they interact with each other, it normally uh, one of the uh, participants acquire high velocity and get kicked out of the global cluster. So at the end, at our current age, you're normally being left only with one black hole per global cluster, which stays there, or maybe one binary black hole. <coughs> However, the de detailed numerical simulations first of black hole subclusters show this, that this process, even just if you consider already formed black hole subcluster, is not as effective as it thought. And you normally will be left about 20, 30% of initial black holes still remaining at our epoch. For the same result was shown later for uh, whole models of global clusters when you have both normal stars and black holes. So this evaporation is not as effective as it thought and you still could have about 20% of black holes left in you know, global clusters. So what we try to assume is that you take that 10% of all your ever formed black holes still remain in the, in the global clusters, even after uh, equipartition, after natal kicks, after everything. And in this case, you can get the estimate how many black holes you see in the whole sample of global clusters that has been observed for, to detect the X-ray sources. So it's about a few thousand black holes per each observed sample. <coughs> So from this number of black holes, you can make another step and, make, uh, and calculate the formation rates. To calculate the formation rates, you need to know how long your X-ray binary can live. So the lifetime of an X-ray binary with a black hole is actually pretty simple. It doesn't really change much on a, uh, with a black hole mass. So here is a, like a time uh, evolution of a black hole uh, white dwarf binary. Here's the mass, here's the X-ray luminosity, and here's the mass transfer rate. So the difference, there is no much difference between three solar mass and 10 solar mass black hole. However, what is important is that persistent stage at which the source can be actually seen as a very bright X-ray source is pretty short. And so for 10 solar masses black hole, it's only about two and 10 and five solar years. <coughs> and only three times longer if you just will consider that to be a ultra-luminous X-ray source. <coughs> so, assuming if, for example, indeed all black holes evaporate and, and only one black hole is left per each global cluster in observed sample, then there, there is a... <coughs> 
when there is a formation rate about one extra binary per black hole per giga year. If, on the other hand, more than one black hole is left, but about 10% of all ever formed, then it's about 4 and 10 and minus 3 per initial uh, retaining fraction per black hole per giga year. So the rate, formation rate, which you can observationally require, varies differently, but we can test at least which one we can create theoretically and what does it take from us. So to create theoretically black hole, I will go in a little bit reverse order. First, I will explain you which black hole white dwarf binary, if I've been formed by whatever mechanism it is, could make it to the mass transfer, could become uh, X resources. And then I already will tell at which rate this kind of binaries can be formed. Because it's really hard to just study the rates of formation if you don't know which one will become uh, an X resource. So to understand how it works out, you need to, to, to know that in global clusters where for X-ray binaries, there are two important time scales. So one of them is how quickly a binary just by itself can become an X-ray source. And it's normally defined by the gravitational wave radiation time. But another time is collision time, is how quickly this binary can interact with something else because it's a dense place, lots of st other stars around. So on this plot, I'm showing the initial eccentricity and the binary separation. The black line shows separation between the binaries which will uh, become X resource by themselves and binaries above will at first encounter something else. So something will happen to them. They will be kicked by something. <coughs> so if you had any binary here, you can be certain it will become an X resource. If your binary is here, you need to understand what will happen. And uh, kind of a limiting a binary separation at eccentricity at 0.999 uh, will be 80 solar uh, radii. It's basically the maximum separation from which a binary could make it uh, to become an X-ray by itself. So this is a direct formation of black hole wide X-ray binary zone. Now, what can happen if uh, the star has an encounter? Well, first of all, it can have an encounter with single stars. And those could be main sequence stars or white dwarfs. It just happened that if you calculate what will happen in the result of a, a collision with main sequence star, the black hole white dwarf binary, <coughs> it's normally a pretty tiny one. So if you will try to calculate uh, what will be the result of a collision so that for the binary which actually could have a uh, collision with a single star, you'll find out that almost all of them will in a result merge. If you have a collision with a white dwarf, the result is a little bit different. You are not necessarily merged because you're kind of a sparse already if you compare to the, your intruding white dwarf, but you could have an uh, exchange of a companion. And whenever you have an exchange of a companion, the exchange of a companion in case of binaries happens usually in the case if your intruder is more massive. So whenever you have swapped your companion to a more massive companion, your binary separation increases. And the factor by which it increases is not only by the rate mass ratio of your intruder to your previous companion. So what happens is that normally, you, if you are here in the region where you are likely to have single uh, encounters with single stars, you either merge, if it's a main sequence star, or you're driven here. You became wider. The single stars, it's not the end of the story, also have binary stars. And the efficiency of encounter with binary stars is such that they could pass on much larger distances fr from each other and still have strong influence. In fact, they normally could pass up to 20 binary separation to each other compared to two, which is normal for single stars, for encounters with single stars. So you could pass on the binary separation up to 20 and still have some significant change in your binary structure. And normally what happens as a, uh, as a strong change in the binary structure, if one of the companion of your binary is a black hole, which is actually much more massive than any other uh, stars in the field, you are really, really likely, it's about 30% probability, to form a triple in the result. So whenever you have passing binary, you 
Just grab one of the companion and you form a triple. And in fact, if you will take a pretty reasonable uh, <coughs> binary fraction, oh, sorry, it's here it should be binary fraction, with pretty reasonable binary fraction about 5%, which is pretty normal for global clusters, and consider black hole white with binary with a standard size, you'll find out that it can form triples up to 30 times per giga year. And this exceeds the interaction rates with single stars by far. So if you have a black hole white with binary, it's actually more likely to meet another binary and form a triple rather than to have an encounter with a single star. Why do we actually care about triples? So we care about triples because in case if your th uh, third star is not aligned, and if it's dynamically formed, it's most likely not aligned with your uh, inner binary orbital plane, then you can have enforced so-called cosi mechanism. And cosi mechanism uh, causes large variations in the eccentricity and inclination. Most important for us, of course, is variation in eccentricity of the inner binary, because you, for example, being a circular binary like this, you didn't touch each other, but once your eccentricity pump to, for example, 90%, you could hit the mass of the, the Roche lobe limit and start the mass transfer. So those binaries where the uh, eccentricity can be pumped up uh, and they can start a mass transfer, we call them as uh, TMT systems or a system with triple induced mass transfer. The important thing is that, of course, it can change eccentricity, but it cannot change the binary separation. Okay, so this limits us to the 80, so the maximum binary separation for the black hole white with binary, which you should uh, worry about, is 80 solar radii, because as I said before, it's the maximum binary separation from which you actually can reach the mass transfer limit. And it's only in the case if you pumped up your eccentricity to 99%. <clears throat> On overall, it requires like a full integration about what the probability to get each eccentricity, etc. But uh, in the result of those integrations, what one can find is that if you had a black hole white dwarf binary with a binary separation less than 35 solar radii, it will have a 100% chance to become a triple induced mass transfer within a giga year. If you had an 80 solar radii black hole white dwarf binary, um, we call it optimistic estimate because it will become triple induced mass transfer system, but it will take another few years. And whenever you say about another few gig years, it also means that you have to be sure that it actually been created a few gig years. So one gig year estimate is more reasonable. Important thing is that this uh, triple induced mass transfer system formation will be important for us only in the case if actually the time scale on which Kazai mechanism operates is shorter than the collision time. Because, I mean, if your Cosi time, for example, takes a one giga year and you collide with every star in 10 million years, it's pointless to have a Cosi mechanism. So one can uh, find the ratio between the time scales and likely for us, for all binaries with uh, separation uh, less than 80 solar radio, um, the Cosi time is much, much shorter than the collision time with any binary or single star in the field. So we are pretty sure that this mechanism works pretty well. <coughs> and so, as I said, if you have any formed by some other mechanism, and we'll talk about this a little bit later, a black hole wide of binary up to 35 solar radii, you became an X-ray source. If you have 80 solar radii, you most likely became an X-ray source if, you, if you're optimistic. However, so the other thing is that you might also think about, but maybe you can drag down to this binary separation some binaries which could have been even wider in the beginning. And yes, you can if you will consider uh, weak encounters. So all the previous encounters which I talked about have been strong encounters. And there are weak encounters. It means that you have uh, flybys on a pretty far distance. You don't perturb much your binary, you change slightly the orbital energy, and normally this change is about a few percent. You either became harder if you've been already hard before, or you became softer if you've been soft before. So black hole wide of binary is always hard. 
uh, in our case. So you have a few percent change in every single flyby encounter. And one could calculate that um, in about 100 encounters, uh, you can uh, harden a 1,000 solar radii binary down to 35 solar radii, uh, down to 35 solar radii in a few giga years. So theoretically it's possible, but it will be, it, it's pretty idealistic picture because in the real life, of course, you don't have only weak encounters. Along with weak encounters, you still have strong encounters. So not all of them will make to that. And to understand how many could make to, through uh, <coughs> weak encounters to 35 solar radii, it's actually simulations what are necessary. <coughs> so we studied different cases, uh, and I just will talk about one main case. For example, if you start with a black hole white dwarf binary, which is 500 solar radii, it has non-negative about 1% chance to become a 35 solar radii uh, <coughs> uh, binary. 99% um, of them will be destroyed on the way or will have exchanged their uh, companion. In some cases, this companion, uh, again, will be a white dwarf, but we still more worry about the original binary survival. If you had a 100 solar radii, the uh, percent is already much higher. It's about 30, 13%. So, we know that uh, from 1 to 10% chance to become a very uh, productive TMT binary, even if you've been a really, really white initially. Um, so now, okay, we know that we can create uh, black hole X-ray binaries with different probabilities depending on the separation, so how we create those binaries. So the mechanism was pretty standard and the global cluster, one of them in exchange, so you basically exchange a black hole in any other binary. It means that your post-exchange separation is wider than it was for the binary before, and one can estimate what's the normal separation if you had exchange in the main sequence binary or in the double white dwarf binary, because in case of main sequence binary, also some of them should have been died uh, during this uh, <coughs> exchange, because uh, main sequence are pretty big by themselves, and most likely it happens with uh, double white dwarf binaries. Um, having some population synthesis uh, predictions about what's the population global clusters, one can find the rates. It's about few on 10 and minus 3 gig per giga per black hole. Another way to form is when you just have a black hole uh, colliding with a red giant. This mechanism before proved to be very effective in case of formation of ultra compact extra binaries when your intruder is a neutron star and you have a low mass extra binary. Um, however, in that case, uh, the kinetic energy of the object is almost relatively comparable to the binding energy of envelope. So for neutron star and the red giant, it's pretty easy to form a bound system. That's not the case of a black hole um, and a red giant you have to actually pass pretty close to the center of a red giant in order to create a system that will be able to start a mass transfer. Otherwise, you create a relatively wide binary. It still will be bound if your passing separation is about five uh, red giant radii. However, this binary could not ever become an X resource unless you have triple induced mass transfer or other mechanism in force. So it's pretty li relatively wide. So again, just coming back to here, so we have some binaries which could become X-ray sources directly. If we formed any binaries here, they transferred here, where they have, where also you can have some binaries coming from hardening from white binaries at different probabilities depending on what's the initial separation. And depending on where they end up, um, the triple mechanism move them to this line where, again, they could uh, evolve just by themselves to X resources. Taking all the mechanisms into account and calculated the probabilities of all the channels, we can find that with conservative estimate, we can explain the formation rate inferred from observations only if um, a fraction of black holes is about 10% of all ever formed black holes. So, in optimistic case, we'll require that at least 
of all ever formed black holes will remain in the global cluster. So whatever you do, how you want to push it strongly, in all the cases you require that a significant fraction, at least 1% of the black holes, should have remained in global clusters. And it's kind of important because if you still have at least 1% of black holes remaining in global clusters, it means that they not only form the X resources, which are easily seen from the far, but they live really short, but they also will most likely form a black hole, black hole binaries, which could be seen in um, LIGA. So the conclusions are, we are still discovering how uh, one can form X ray binaries. We do not know everything yet. We I think that we made significant process, progress in understanding um, of uh, how black hole X binaries with low mass companions have been formed energetically, how they evolve through the mass transfer. Uh, we still do not understand why we do not see in a failed black hole wide wolf X ray binaries, because theoretically we have no constraints for it. Um, detection over first. Uh, exact, but maybe a few more black hole white wolf binaries in global clusters gives us new constraints on the dynamical evolution of global clusters. And uh, just along all the lines, we find another mechanism to evolve through the common envelope. And I think that it's very exciting mechanism because it uh, can both explain low mass extra binary formation and uh, give GRBs with type 1C supernova connection. Thank you. Right. So, does this not imply that all the extra binaries should be in the internals? I mean, should that be verified? So, if you're using cosine, how much is it just be? So, you go with the. For global clusters, yeah. for black holes, it should imply, but we cannot prove it. They all in extra galactic global clusters. We don't have any observations which could help us. I mean, we know one neutron star X ray binary in global cluster in our galaxy, which we think is in a triple. But for neutron stars, this mechanism is not as effective as for black holes. So, the, like, the probability to form a triple in a result of binary binary encounter is only a few percent compared to 30 percent with black holes, and just because the mass of a black hole is much higher. Um, but unfortunately, for these extragalactic X ray sources, the best thing we have is just the X ray luminosity. <laughs> and what's the destruction path? I mean, once you form this, presumably it's lifetime, you said, by having an encounter with another binary and just want to take the triple, right? Yes. So that's why I say we compare the Kazai time scale to the collision time. So that's the most important thing that uh, once you form the triple, uh, the Kazai mechanism compared to the collision time happens almost immediately. So, so I mean, it's not immediately. Yeah, any other story. Yeah. Yeah. Between the triple and any other story. Well, it's presumably not with single stars, it's presumably encountered. It doesn't matter. I mean, you calculate the whole probability of encounters. Then, how long is the collision time compared to the lifetime as a career? Is that short or long? <coughs> As a creator, it's 10 and 5. The collision time is 10 and 7 and an 8. Oh, so, so then we would see you form the triple in, in a tiny, tiny amount of time, it starts accreting and then it shuts off. So yes. it's still a triple always while it's accreting. Yeah, most likely. You just don't know about it. Huh? You just don't know about it. Yeah. yeah, but it would mean that every one of these systems should still be in a triple while we're still seeing the X-rays. But if, if you play this game, let's assume all of these guys are black holes out there and other black hole clusters. Mm -hmm. And that would imply to me, and then you need to have at least 1% of black holes be retained in the cluster for that to work. Mm -hmm. And you get one black hole for every 200, 200 solar masses. Mass, yes. So then you have one black hole for every 20,000 solar masses. And we have uh, other 20,000. Uh, yeah, 20, yeah. You have a cloud their cluster, whatever, a million solar masses. Mm -hmm. right? So that means every cloud their cluster initially 
well, today, 150 black holes, yes. which would mean there should be lots of black hole binaries. So why haven't we seen them yet? No, that's not lots of black hole binaries because, I mean, that was No, no, I'm not talking about accreting. I mean black hole, black hole binaries that are forming. You have, now we let this cook for billions of years. I would think, I'm not sure, but you guys would calculate this, how many systems would we see in a glob, in our local globular clusters that we should see with LIGO already? Yeah, you see what I'm saying? Yeah, about 10% of them should be in binaries all the time. Yeah. Binaries with another black hole. Well, with something. With something. But but they like to be with a companion who's equally massive once you they have them exchange. <coughs> yeah. But I would think if we have so many black holes in the globulars, and they're relatively close, we have uh, hundreds in our galaxy, they could have been detected by LIGO, at least one of them. Or, uh, or not, I don't know, that's a detailed calculation. Um, so the probability to be in any other, with any other star is about 10%. Uh, however, even though they do like more to be in a black hole, it's also the probability, I mean, you, you take the whole stellar population. So. For example, a, another black hole has a 10% higher chance to be in a binary with a black hole, but you have thousands times more main sequence stars. So it's still a very low fraction of them to be in the black holes. Maybe one or two per hour global clusters, uh, per hour Milky Way global cluster population. One or two per but, each cluster. Yeah, but it still doesn't say that it's an illegal regime. In what regime? But it's an illegal window. Oh, the live over <laughs> No, but that would be something that you could calculate and then already say, we haven't seen it. So this seems like a huge amount of black holes in globules to me. That they're getting retained. Well, we we rather hoped about that maybe we will be detected from extra. <coughs> I, I just I think we made it uh, back of an envelope estimate, but it didn't work out for our global cluster in the Milky Way. Oh yeah, the last three seconds. Yeah. yeah. Questions? So coherent, everyone understood everything perfectly. Well, if there are no further questions, there will be an opportunity to speak to Natasha before we head out for dinner. Let's thank her again for